the uh, uh, council work session order, please. Madam Clerk, if you'd read the roll. Ms. Cole? Here. Mr. Jones? Here. Mr. Schmidt? Here. Mr. Lind? Here. Mr. Morrissey? Here. Mr. Welper? Here. Mr. Hart? Here. Motion to approve the agenda. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Ladies and gentlemen, we're here today to uh, kind of uh, start the initial discussion, the first discussion on the uh, uh, revised animal control ordinance changes regarding dangerous dogs, dangerous animals in general. Uh, I, I know there's been some, um, I was going to say impatience, and that's the wrong word, absolutely. No, it's uh, it's taken us a while to, to get to this point, but uh, I will explain to all of you that uh, we did not take this situation lightly last summer when we were having issues. Uh, we don't take it lightly now, and we have spent a lot of hours uh, going through uh, our ordinance as we have it, had it before. Uh, suggestions from all of you that came in, were, every one of them were looked at, whether they were emailed or phone called in. Every one of them were looked at. We looked at ordinances from other cities from around the country. We included our uh, city attorney, Chris Wendlin, uh, Brad Neeland, who is a veterinarian, uh, Donna Penny, who is, uh, works with dogs often, uh, Sandy and Maria, who work with the dogs on a daily basis. There was a lot of effort put into this ordinance as it's presented to you today. And what we're looking for is uh, feedback from, from you. Uh, I, I don't think it's, we're going to get it to a perfect state where everybody agrees that it's just perfect on everybody's uh, uh, account. But we are going to go through it today and, uh, and see what we come up with. Uh, we were very careful, and you'll see this in the ordinance, to not have a breed specific ordinance. It's about uh, holding owners accountable for the actions of their animals. So I'm going to turn it over to Sandy uh, Greco, who is in charge of our animal control department. And Sandy, why don't you start it off, please? Okay, um, first of all, thanks for this and thanks for your patience because it has taken us a while. Um, I would really like to thank Chris Wendland. He's worked very, very hard um, with us and I know it's been confusing and frustrating at times. Um, what you have right now is a draft of the city's revised animal and dangerous animal ordinance um, that has been completed right now. Uh, research and references from other cities and organizations were conducted by animal control officers. Um, myself, uh, a council member, veterinarian, uh, insurance personnel, attorneys, rescue, rescue volunteers, and also a nurse. Um, we are a no-kill shelter. Our numbers are remarkable. Um, from July 1st through mid-December, we have saved 89 dogs and 146 cats. We have euthanized only eight dogs and 11 cats due to injuries or aggressiveness. Through the help of Agape and Heart Rescue and Cedar Valley Pitbull Rescue, who have been outstanding in placing and getting other rescues to step up and to help our animals has been remarkable. Through hard work and the time our volunteers have put forth to help make animal control a success is something we are very proud of. Um, our goal is to educate and help make pet owners responsible in the control and caring of their animals. Um, City Attorney Chris Wenlin included provisions of Chapter 1, Articles A and B. Some sections were renumbered while others had changes and some articles were moved from A to B or B to A. Um, I'm going to basically point out uh, some of the most important ones that, that we really, really worked hard on. Um, dangerous animal regulations, which is 5-1B-1A through D, were separated um, as well as we could from the dangerous dog ordinance. There's dangerous animals and there's dangerous dogs. We separated those. Sandy, I, I, hang on just a second. I'm sorry. I didn't do what I said I was going to do. If anybody doesn't have a copy of the new ordinance, we do have extra copies. If anybody would like to have one that doesn't have one, uh, Maria's, I think somebody's got them right there. So, Okay, thank you. I'm sorry, Sandy. What, what okay. page are you on? Right now we're not on a page. Hang on. Okay. <laughs> Okay, um, some fees were adjusted um, and citations, municipal infractions were increased. Um, neutered and spayed cats and dogs license fee will remain the same at $5 a year, um, which they double after March 31st to 10. But we would like to increase the unaltered cats and dogs 
from $10 a year to $25 a year, and then they will also double from $20 to $50 a year. Um, we did address chronic violators. Um, we made changes were made in the definition of regulatory dogs. So we have potentially dangerous, we have dangerous, and we have vicious dogs now. That's 5-1B-1. Okay, potentially dangerous dogs are basically on a watch list, which means they really haven't um, attacked or anything yet, but due to maybe calls we've gotten or they've been loose, there's a probability that they might. So they're potentially. Um, dangerous dogs and, and vicious dogs um, were also defined uh, more aggressive. Um, your regulatory dogs, which the potentially dangerous dogs, um, even though they're on this watch list, they in turn have requirements um, of a obedience training and also the possibility of being removed from this list um, after three years. <coughs> Dangerous and vicious dogs, these are subsections 5-1B, 5C, and G, permit animal con control to take swift and decisive action to euthanize animals. Dangerous and vicious dogs are generally treated alike, except that vicious dogs that attack can be destroyed without an appeal. Right now, we are in this revised ordinance, we're allowing Pet owners that have that have been deemed dangerous, their dogs have been deemed dangerous or vicious, to appeal to the city council. Um, if they win their appeal and they follow all the guidelines of a potentially dangerous dog, um, they can keep their dog. Um, this is up to your discretion. This is just something we're putting forward, mainly because we don't want to euthanize every dangerous dog that comes through. Again, our goal is to make Waterloo safer and hold pet on owners accountable. Um, it is not to destroy all dangerous and vicious dogs. However, they cannot be removed from the Waterloo city limits. We are not sending our dangerous or vicious dogs to some other county, town, city. That's not allowed. If people want to remove them, they're gonna have to be euthanized. We're not gonna allow them to go. Um, a potentially dangerous dog can be moved to another city or county. However, they have to fill out forms and that destination that they're going to will be notified. We in turn will receive no vicious or dangerous dogs from another city, county, or township. We will not allow that to happen. If it does, if that dog does come into our city, it will be destroyed. Um, under this ordinance, um, and Chris Winland really helped me out on this one, uh, the dogs deemed as dangerous or vicious can be destroyed under following circumstances. If the dog bites and is not redeemed after a rabies testing or quarantine, it can be euthanized. If it is found at large and not redeemed, it can be euthanized. If it wasn't spayed or neutered per agreement, it can be taken and euthanized. <clears throat> if it was previously declared to be dangerous or vicious and is found at large and can't be captured or contained, it can be euthanized on the spot. If it is determined to be a regulated dog and is not removed or redeemed, it can be euthanized. If it is a registered dog that is not removed from the city or destroyed per agreement, we can take it and euthanize it. If it is a dangerous or vicious dog that was brought in from another jurisdiction that had found it to be dangerous or vicious in that area, we can take it and euthanize it. If it is to be registered and the owner does not get it done, we can take the dog and euthanize it. If it attacks and was previously determined to be dangerous or vicious, we'll take it and euthanize it. If it is in possession of an irresponsible dog owner, we have the right to take it and euthanize it. <coughs> Animal control will have some discretion in these where um, the dog could be placed with the rescue, possibly, but it would be up to the animal control 
or a veterinarian or a trainer to determine that. Other matters we addressed are puppies and breeding. We would like to stop the backyard breeding. So what we would like to do is um, if somebody wants to have a litter of puppies, they have to be either AKC registered or registered through some organization. They just can't have puppies. Um, we also will have a permanent identification. We will start mi microchipping ourselves. We do have those in hand now so we can start microchipping. There will be a cost, however, for that. Um, if a dog is picked up and not redeemed or it is redeemed, we give the owner 30 days to either spay <coughs> or neuter the animal. Um, guard dog registrations will be the same as a potentially dangerous dog. So we have a record of where this dog is. They have to pay the um, registration fee and everything. So we, we know exactly where this dog is, so if it would get loose. Um, we are going after irresponsible dog owners. We also have a landlord liability now. And we also have some rules on tethering where um, an owner cannot put their dog on a log chain, cannot leave their dog out longer than eight hours, must have a dog house. This will also help us when, um, especially in inclement weather, like when it's freezing out, we can come and take a dog now. Um, and cite the owner. Okay, again, this is just a draft. Um, those of us who have worked on these changes welcome comments and are open for discussion. Um, we, the city as a whole, has received comments and questions. We did receive some from... <coughs> yeah, I know, you today which I did go through all those, but I just didn't have time to, to, to incorporate it into this. Um, and we will take everything into consideration and discuss it. So we're open. I, I guess our question is, did we accomplish what you wanted us to? Um, are we on the right track? And if there's anything further you would like to see us do, you know, we're open. Okay. Let's, uh, let's do this. Let's open it up to questions right now from Sandy, uh, from council for Sandy, and then we'll start taking comments from the audience. Carolyn? Hi, Sandy, and thank you, and you, and everybody. I know it took a long time, and I was one of the most impatient, but I also probably had the most full inbox on this <coughs> situation. Um, if we go back to last summer, to that horrifying incident where the woman was attacked on Real Street by the three extraordinarily vicious dogs. How would that situation play out under this ordinance? Would those dogs be seized and put down immediately? According to this right now, um, the owner, like we did last summer, gave him the option to come forward and follow all of our guidelines for a potentially dangerous or dangerous dog that we had in our old ordinance. Um, he did not, so of course the animals came to us and they were euthanized. Um, it would be basically up to, and maybe Chris can help me on this, um, the discretion of the animal control officer handling the case um, to determine if this dog should be put down immediately or not. Well, it would be after testing or after the quarantine period. Council, and, you have and this can be changed. I mean, this is just a draft. Yeah, so. sure. uh, Mr. Hart? Just to add to that question, um, the animal control officer or a police officer has the, the authority, though, to go on a person's premises and get the dog, or is that only if it is, the dog is living in conditions that are not conducive to what we have established? No, according to um, this ordinance here, the new one, they would have the right to go on the property and seize the dog or check and see if it's up to date on rabies and, and all that. They have the right to go in and do that. Mr. Jones? I've got a, a number of questions. Is this the right time to go sure. through some of those? Sure. Okay. 
Great. Thank you for the major effort on this. It took me quite a while to, to get through it. It is uh, comprehensive and somewhat complicated. Um, in the areas where it lists out, it lists out fees throughout the document. Would we, would we be looking at a separate schedule of fees so we don't have to continuously update this particular ordinance? Would be one question because they're written throughout. Um, the municipal infractions in pretty much now we follow what is like code enforcement and in, in, in it's pretty set fee for your citations. Um, as for we have increased our pickup fee from 15 to $25 and then $10 on top of that if it happens within the same year, <coughs> um, each pickup. That we look at staying pretty level for a while. Okay. And the licenses um, would stay as is. Um, if you approve this, if not, we'll go back to ten dollars and twenty. Okay. For noisy or annoying animals, um, I think it's the same as it is today. Uh, residents of at least three neighboring households must sign a citation or a petition. Is that correct? Yes. And doesn't that stop a lot of people from coming forward? You know, it does sometimes, but actually. Um, that request came down from the court system. Okay. Right. And then on uh, page five, where it talks about the annual licensing fees of, of what is it, $5 or $10 for each dog or cat that is spayed or neutered, uh, and 25 for each dog or cat that is not. And then the last line of, of that paragraph it says after March 31st of each year annual licensing fees shall double right and it's been that way after each year because at $25 well, no, after, after March 31st for the annual license but it yeah. says after each year so after at $25 after 12 years it'll be $51,200 oh, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> each, each year the, the that's a little confusing well, Each year the license is the same. It just doubles after March 31st. So instead of $5, it's it costs $10 if you wait until after March 31st. Right. Mm. Okay. I like your $51,000. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> That's thinking about revenue. And then moving on to page six about puppies, I was really unclear about uh, item E where it talks about a litter uh, at any time exceeding two puppies. How does that work? How do, how do you, how, do, how does a dog only have two puppies? Little dogs very often only have two puppies or sometimes one. But there's others that have more, so oh, what do you? Sometimes six. What do you do with the other dog puppies? Okay, I might need some help with Chris on this one. Um, what we're trying to do is stop breeding completely. Yeah. So if a female dog has more than two puppies, we want to go in and take them because is that is, maybe you can help me I on would hope it one. would be a female <laughs> yeah uh, you have to pick a number that represents you know somebody's got uh, a dog with a, a puppy or two they got somewhere else uh, versus puppies produced by the female in the household so you know two is a pretty pretty small number it's in most situations that I'm aware of and we can change this but uh, most dogs have more than two puppies if they're going to have a litter. So by setting the number at a low level, we're essentially providing a definite number, but it's for the concept that you're having puppies in the household and that's prohibited by the ordinance. I was also somewhat confused about the difference between the dangerous dogs and the vicious dogs. And to Carolyn's question about last summer, you know, I, I would think that would have been labeled as a vicious dog and, and put down. I don't understand why we would putting, be putting vicious dogs back to the neighborhoods to potentially do the same thing. And, and I believe, according to this, that the animal control officer could deem it vicious and they, they have the right to say. Yeah, that's right. What we're trying to accomplish with this ordinance is to give quite a bit of enforcement 
discretion because there's a whole sliding scale of situations in which dogs react in certain ways. We don't want to take a wooden, rigid approach and uh, I don't want to spin out hypotheticals here, but it's probably easy for us to imagine situations where uh, a dog did something bad, bit somebody, but maybe there was some reason in view of all the circumstances why we would think a dog's not likely to do that again. So we don't necessarily want to destroy them. Uh, going back to last summer's incident, uh, it's been a while since I looked at the facts of that, but it's possible in that circumstance uh, that the dogs could have been labeled as vicious dogs, and if deemed appropriate in the circumstances, uh, and there's a lot of factors that go into an evaluation of the circumstances, but if appropriate, uh, under the ordinance as we've drafted it here, <coughs> excuse me, uh, the dog or dogs could have been put down. But they could also have been determined to be dangerous or, or vicious, but not likely to be repeat offenders. Um, <coughs> so. Okay. And on that page nine of vicious dogs, uh, I guess five one B two keeping of dangerous animals prohibited the exceptions. I was really curious about B five for purposes of bona fide religious practice or ritual. What? What are the People circumstances around that? People handle snakes. Okay. Some yeah. religions handle snakes as part of This their is the dangerous animal part, not the dangerous dog part. Gotcha. Okay. Very good. Okay. Um, on page 12, the portion about guard dogs. So I thought this was kind of a, maybe a, an exception where people can just say that they're vicious or dangerous dogs or guard dogs and bypass all the rules. Um, so kind of reading this a little further, is there a limitation to if you have a house of how many guard dogs you can actually have? Is it one? It probably should be one if they're considered a guard dog. And these are, these are animals that really can't be put on a leash and walked around the neighborhood, right? If they're a guard dog, they stay in that fenced yard. They never come out, unless they're going to the vet or some of these other exceptions, right? You can't walk a guard dog in the neighborhood, or can you? No. <laughs> you shouldn't. Right, you can't, yeah. or shouldn't tie them up. I mean, it has to be a fenced yard, and it's right. a very... Junkyard. I mean, well, these can be residences too, right? We can't tell people they can't have guard dogs, but it's a very specific rule around guard dogs. It's not your domestic pet that you're just calling a guard dog, right? That's why we kind of put it in with a potentially dangerous where they have to follow all the registration. And <coughs> okay, I just wanted to be very clear about this because it seemed like a loophole and that you just put up a sign that says, you know, guard dog and a lot of this other stuff didn't apply. But there's, I think, very specific things around having a guard dog. You, yeah, Chris, do you have a response to that? Please. Well, the first response is that this is fundamentally not a new provision. It's been on the books for a long time. Um, what we did differently with this is that we made them subject to a lot of the registration requirements for dangerous dogs. Not everything. I, um, I don't think they had to be spayed or neutered right out of the gate to be a guard dog necessarily, but by and large, I think they have to comply with the other requirements of a dangerous dog, and uh, because they're registered, uh, they're on the same list as the other ones, and if they get out, they're subject to the same penalties or enforcement actions as a regular dog would be. Uh, we did not try and tinker with the definition of guard dog to, we just didn't try and change that. No. I, it, it, I wasn't aware that that was a concept that was of any concern to anyone, but we can work with that if you feel we need to. Okay. And just that whole registration process, I mean, it is, it is quite extensive. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it's really unfortunate that it, it's easier to get a permit to carry a concealed weapon than it is to register a dangerous dog. And it's just, it seems the way things are going these days. We have control over registering dogs. We don't have control no, I, over I get that. I'm just uh, a comment on the state of affairs. 
Um, on page 13, item C, it talks about insurance and that you have to uh, show proof of insurance. Um, I think we may need to add something about, about keeping that insurance in force during the entire registration period. I mean, you can't just have it and not, you know, if it, you're paying month to month, you can't have it for one month. You have to have it for the whole registration period. And on page 14, item J about spade and neuter, it does not apply to the guard dogs, apparently. So I don't know if that's we going to We can change that, you know? I mean, it doesn't, it was, we can add that in, the guard dog. Oh, it's just uh, something I, I noticed going through here. David, some of those are, are good points. Maybe all of them are good points. And I, I think if, if we could uh, maybe get you to submit uh, some kind of a, you know, an, an itemized list of what you just said to Sandy and Chris to, uh, to review some of those things, I, I think that would be totally <coughs> appropriate uh, so that we don't forget what you just said. Sure. And that, would, that would be good. Uh, we, we're, we're cutting into the public time, but council, uh, further questions or it, comments? Mr. Uh, Mayor. Uh, uh, Pat did first, Tom, I'm sorry, Pat. Yeah, uh, Ms. Greco, uh, thank you very much. And uh, along with what uh, I'll call it Councilman Jones is saying with guard dogs, uh, the language there, it's, it says the wording guard dog or words simil of similar import. Does that mean that anybody ha that has a beware of dog sign on their house, that name then labels them as a guard dog within that property and would they have to report that to the police chris do you remember the, how we got to the definition of guard dog requirements well as i said guard dog is a is a concept that was in the ordinance long before the the tinkering we've been doing here and we didn't change the definition of it um it, it was really on the radar screen, so we weren't thinking about whether someone's going to call their Pekingese a guard dog or some other kind of a dog a guard dog. Uh, I suppose they could, but then there's the requirement that they always keep it in a fenced enclosure or structure at all times and can't trot around the neighborhood with it. Um, so there are some limitations inherent in the idea, but uh, we didn't try and define the, the scope or the tenacity of the dog or what's classically thought of as a guard dog because there's variants about that as well. If this language was already here, was there was a language there that said that uh, a person in possession of that animal would have to report it then? No, that is new. That's the, new. the registration requirement is new. I think, I think language that they, uh, let's see. I believe the requirement that they inform animal control in the police department was there previously. I'd have to check back, but I think that was there before. I have that with me, the old one. Okay. Um, here's what it reads. It says, the prohibition contained in this article shall not apply to keeping of guard dogs. However, guard dogs must be kept within a structure, fenced enclosure at all times, and any guard dog found at large may be processed as dangerous dog pursuant to the provisions of this article. Any premises guarded by a guard dog shall be prominently posted with a sign containing the word guard dog or words similar import, and the owner of such premises shall inform the animal control department and the police department in writing that a guard dog is on duty at the premises. It shall be the owner's responsibility to notify the animal control department immediately when a guard dog has escaped and is running at large. So pretty and much that's from same. 1988. So, and I think in effect, and I mean, because you call it a guard dog and post it, as long as you keep it within the confined area, it doesn't relieve you of requiring all of those covenants of having a dangerous animal. Right. The, the primary change here is that you now have to register it. it right. It's not just a matter of giving Sandy a call and saying, hey, I've got a guard dog. You've got to pay these registration fees, do all this other stuff, microchip your dog, have insurance, et cetera. I, I just, my, my, I'm, I'm still uh, concerned that there's some ambiguity there 
uh, when it comes down to, to naming your animal whatever and you have beware of dog on your on your premises that it uh, could be construed by neighbors to mean that that's a guard dog whereas the owner may not see that but it doesn't relieve the owner of having to re meet all of those requirements but right. i think that's that's the, the the crux of it is the owner still has to meet all the requirements <coughs> the dog. and then i had one other uh, question um on page eight uh under dangerous dog on four, um, the last part of that, or by a person in the process of treating or rendering aid to a previously injured animal, can you explain number four there under dangerous dog? B4. Chris? Uh, this is language borrowed from other examples. Um, just reaching back to my own. Uh, history with animals is that when they're injured, they tend uh, not to behave the best, no matter what kind of training or prior his history they've had. So when you're working on an injured animal, you may well get snapped at, bit, or something of that nature. So it's just recognizing the reality that injured animals can be inherently dangerous because of their temporary condition. Okay. And we've had Thank that you. happen Thank you. when we've picked up injured animals. They'll have a tendency to bite, you know. Thanks, Pat. Tom, you had questions? Um, Sandy, since we're going after irresponsible owners, why are we involving landlords? What was, it, what um, was the thought behind that? Okay, at this time, when um, a citation is issued or a warning is issued to a pet owner who is in a rental property, the landlord is notified. Yes, the landlord's notified. So we're bringing in landlords so at least they can be responsible for their tenants. And if there's a major problem, um, sometimes it's up to them to, I can't really say threaten their tenant, but you know, tell them either you get rid of the dog or you're, you're gone. So this way at least the tenant know, is, is also notified that the landlord knows what's going on. It's just a little more control if there's a problem with dangerous dogs, which we have in certain areas of town. Mr. Schmidt. Sandy, of, uh, of the si of the 16 page of document we have here, I mean, how much of this has been changed or rewritten? Um, I can email you, I mean, I have everything highlighted that okay. has been changed or um, tweaked or something added or taken out. Um, Quickly, Chris, um, I could I could quickly march you through and okay. point out what's I mean I just new or fairly new and okay because it seems like been some of the stuff we're talking about it's like well that's from 1968 yeah. or, or whatever and I'm not exactly. sure why we're talking about that so yeah and it appears here because it was more suitable to relocate it somewhere else I mean yeah. the manner of legislation things are just stacked on top of other things and sometimes over the years it doesn't end up being the, the best presentation okay. so. Um, all right, so 5-1-8, that was moved from current 5-1-A-9. Page 2, 5-1-9 was moved from current 5-1-A-7. I understand when I'm talking about these moving, uh, if I don't say more about it, I may have done some small tweaking with a bit of the wording, but nothing of, of substance to point out. 5-1-10 uh, was moved from current 5-1A-6, paragraph C. 5-1-11 is new. 5-1-12 is new. 5-1-13 is combined from former 5-1A-12 and 5-1A-11, paragraph A. Page four, uh, the definitions shown there are new. Uh, same on 5-1A-1, new definitions. Page five, uh, we changed basically the license fee, but the rest of it is substantially the same. 5-1A-6, there were some wording changes here and there, but uh, paragraph two under 
paragraph B on page 5 is new. So that's paragraph B2 is new. Paragraph D on feeding feral cats is new. Paragraph E on page 6, dealing with puppies, is new. 5-1A-7 was moved from current 5-1A-8. <coughs> the next section was moved from current 5-1A-10. The following section from 5-1A-11. However, there are some new paragraphs under that section. Paragraphs B, C, and D are all new. Uh, page 7, the definitions there are either tweaked or new. Uh, dangerous dog is a new definition. Uh, potentially dangerous dog is a new definition. Regulated dog is new. That's just an umbrella term for potentially dangerous, dangerous, and vicious. And vicious dog is new. Uh, the following sections had changes made to them. Page 10, section 5-1B-4 was moved from 5-1B-6. Page 11, 5-1B-5 has uh, changes made to it, but it was formerly 5-1B-4. Page 12, uh, the guard dog was formerly 5-1B-5. 5-1B-7 is in the same place, but has had changes made to it. Page 14, paragraph K on obedience training is new. Paragraph M, automatic enhancement of regulated status is new. Section 1B-8 is new. Uh, actually, all of page 15 is new. And the enforcement paragraph or a section on page 16 is a combination of new and reformatted, recombined kind of sections. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. So, Mr. Mayor, if I could ask just a couple quick sure. questions. So, Sandy, going back to page uh, one, the five dash one in the sanitary uh, conditions, item B. What are the? I mean. What are the repercussions for violations if they don't adhere to that? I didn't see that identified there. I mean, uh, um, is the fine set someplace else or what? Unsanitary conditions? Yeah. Okay. If you don't. Um, usually we issue a warning mm -hmm. and give them so many hours, depending on the time of year, because right now it's pretty hard. Um, and then if it isn't done in due time, then a citation is issued, and it'll be a regular citation like it'll be $200 now. Yeah, it'll be a $200 fine. Okay. So on page two, animal biting persons, uh, that item A, their duty to report. What what are the repercussions for that? If they're not reported? Yeah. Um, for a bite? Well, actually, um, if a dog bites, the owner is supposed to notify us or the person bitten. We are notified by all the clinics, hospitals, everything. You know, when there's a bite, that we get copies of that fax to us right away. Chris, please. Oh, I was just going to say that where the ordinance doesn't prescribe a particular penalty, um, the default <coughs> enforcement repercussion is that it's a municipal infraction, which the first offense is $750. Subsequent offenses are $1,000. Could also be a um, uh, simple misdemeanor, but typically it's going to be handled as a municipal infraction. Okay. Thanks. Uh, for the noisy ordinance, are there hours stipulated, or is that 24 hours a day? No hours. Okay. Um, and on enforcement on page three, again, repercussions. Does that go back to what Chris was saying about it? Just goes to uh, municipal infraction. I, I'm sorry. What did you say? On on page three at enforcement, uh, what are the repercussions for that again? That would be the same. Same thing as yeah, what? Yeah, generally speaking, it's going to be okay. a municipal infraction. Um, and then with the, the puppy issue again, going back to page six. 
So number one, are we saying that if somebody has a dog that has puppies and it has six puppies, and we find out they have six puppies, we're gonna go and take four of those six puppies? We, leave we them have, to? We, we would. Um, and there's discretion in there too, you know? What we're trying to do is stop breeding. Well, and I'm not arguing with you. I'm just, I'm just asking this. And, and it also mentions in there about, you know, un, unless the animals are AKC animals. And there's other organizations, too, that, you know, they could register with a, a professional organization. So, um. so we, will we identify those other organizations, or are we just going to leave it AKC? No, you know, that's question number one. And then question number two, are we going to hear that we're being a little... Uh, I'm not sure what the word I want is, elitist or something, that if you have the money to have a purebred dog, you can have a litter of six or eight or ten, but if you don't and you've got a mutt and a lot of great dogs are mutts, but then you're not going to be, I mean, I, and again, I'm not arguing with you. I'm just wanting to make sure we aren't setting ourselves up here for more well, complications. And this is probably one that we need to sit down and discuss. Okay. <clears throat> And then on municipal pound, uh, I assume that that city may establish somewhere in there. Do we mention about meeting all state or federal guidelines or, or whatever for that? Because as I remember, when we were kind of taking over this animal control, there were a number of questions about heat and cooling and, and all the stuff that I don't know anything about. Well, um, in order to get licensed by the state, you have to meet their requirements. So it's that's really a state regulations that you have okay. to meet so I don't I don't know if we would need to list all those in ours all right okay thank you you bet further questions <coughs> Sandy uh, Ron Sandy um, I mean this is a tremendous amount of information to absorb here uh, how are people who have these animals dogs cats whatever uh, how are they gonna know about all these ordinances are, are, are we gonna get them a copy of this when they apply for their license or how, how are they gonna know if well, they're in violation or right this is, this is on the website right now okay and I'm Tim I'm sure we'll put a good article in the paper word um, for word and, and it's I, I would say word of mouth you know if people license we'll be more than happy to give them a copy of the ordinance you know so it's just it's getting the word out there Carol I'm sorry Ron just let me just finish are you well, yeah I'm just Curious how people are going to know if they're in violation. Well, but it, it's kind of the same, Ron. With with, I mean, we had an ordinance before. We've got all kinds of ordinances about all kinds of things, and those people that deal with them tend to know the rules, and particularly those that violate the rules tend to know what they are. I mean, just, them, but just you're right. Just reading through this, I can yeah. see numerous violations throughout the community. Yeah. Right. Uh, and yeah. our officers, <laughs> our officers are really good. You know, if people honestly don't understand, they're going to explain it to them. They're not just going to issue them a citation. I think, I think that's a very important part, as we do with code enforcement and everything else. The intent is not to see how many tickets we can write. It's to, it's to deal with the owners, the irresponsible owners, and to educate the responsible ones so that they know what to do. Carolyn? Just to follow up on Mr. Welper's comment, um, I would guess that the, major, the vast majority of animal owners in the city will probably never be familiar with this. I mean, everybody knows you license your dog um, and get rabies shots. But I see this as an enforcement tool for the really, really bad owners who have been violating, who should have been, who should not own animals, okay? And if they are going to own them, they should pay for the animal's bad behavior. Um, it's a personal accountability thing, and I know that is not a popular thing in our culture today, but owners need to be accountable for their dogs, and this gives us a way to make them so. Well, uh, Mr. Mayor, yeah? one of the questions I had, and I don't know, Ms. Greco, if you could answer this, but what if there's somebody who owns a dog that uh, uh, has a vicious attack upon, uh, upon somebody and uh, chooses to, uh, they, they know that their dog attacked, they know their dog hurt somebody seriously, they take that dog and get that dog out of town. Um, um, what happens then? I mean, I, I see that there's a part in here where there can be some 
orders uh, related to enforcement, but uh, what if that person keeps that dog, nobody knows where it's at, and then brings that dog back in at a later date? We have and does the police ever get involved in investigations like this? We have had that happen before. And um, in fact, we've basically chased people around town because we know that they're moving. And we usually end up finding out where they are and, and uh, confiscating the dog. That you'd be, and a lot of times we have to have police with us. You'd be amazed at how connected Maria is to the animal community in town <laughs> and, and how she knows animals and where they are. <laughs> it's, uh, it's pretty amazing. And who owns them? And who, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, council, and, and all, uh, we're not gonna vote on this today. This is our first shot across the bow with this. So uh, I, I had anticipated to have more time for public input today. Uh, we're down to literally 10 minutes for public input. We will have another work session prior to uh, asking uh, the council to vote on this, if not more than that. Uh, I, I want to fully vet this and give you guys the opportunity to discuss things. So uh, I, I, I'm not going to start the three minute clock. I, I'm just going to admonish Randy that if, if you want to take all 10 minutes, that's fine. If you want to take less than that or whatever, but uh, go ahead and, and give us some, start some rebuttal. We will have more conversation <coughs> before it's over with. And, and also before we, before we before we end, I know let, let, people let, who want to get up here. Okay, let me let me say also that uh, as we did through this process, if you have uh, thoughts and comments and you, you want to come the next time, that's fine. If you want to email them beforehand to Sandy or to me, so that we have an opportunity to kind of look at them, like uh, Mr. Herod brought in three pages of comments today, Six. so it gives us an. Uh, I'm sorry. More than that. Oh, was there? I, okay, there were several pages. Of course. So. Uh, Please feel free to do that uh, so that we have an opportunity to look at them. Randy, go ahead. Uh, by the way, those co give us your you name have copies of what I brought in. I would say uh, put give them aside because with the changes that have occurred, I'm not sure they're even applicable. The give us your name and address for the record, please. Randy here at 111 Highland Boulevard. Thank you. Uh, there, I'll, I'll be very quick because I know there's other people who like to say things. The, the discussion that went on about guard dog is not correct, including the attorney. I'm sorry. But from a dog breeders and people who are involved with dog breeding and training for guard dogs and like that, guard dog is a generalized umbrella term that it goes across a group of dogs. They're trained for specific types of work. They are not to be confused with vicious dogs, although certain types of training can put them in the dangerous category. They do not all fall in that category at all. In the part of it that's been around since Tim was mayor, which is this thing about the um, dogs at large. If you got Fido and Fido gets out and they catch it, which they are good at doing, catch Fido and they bring him back, you're gonna pay a fine for that. Gets out again, you're gonna pay another fine, larger. Gets out a third time, even today, without these changes, it is considered a vicious dog. And if Fido is a sweet little dog that all he does is come and lick you and want to be around you or any neighbor, it's still a vicious dog and you still got to get $300,000 liability. And that's wrong. Put that aside. The main thing I wanted to talk about, and I'll keep it as brief as possible, with this thing about going to an obedience school. There's no definition of what kind of obedience school. There's many different kinds of obedience schools, all meant for different kinds of things with different kinds of dogs, with different kinds of trainers. Here you're talking about a dog that's defined as dangerous, and that dog has to probably go through a period of untraining, as does the owner. And I'm telling you right now, there's probably not more than five trainers in this area, if that many, that can do that kind of thing. I don't know how you're gonna get them involved because there's nothing in here that defines how the city relates to that obedience trainer. That obedience trainer has gotta get some kind of written document about why this happened, what the history of the dog is, what the city wants, and there's got to be some kind of authority on it, and they'll have to be paid in advance because probably the owner's not going to pay it because this will not be cheap. You're talking two to $5,000 to do what you guys are talking about with that dog. And all I'm saying is there's nothing in here about that at all. Um, and for Buck, you know, we had talked, and I appreciate the opportunity to see the code, 
and, but we had talked about having a chance to sit down and, and talk about this stuff, and we're not really doing that. Mm -hmm. We have no, as the public, have no real input to this yet. Yeah, we can give you stuff, but it really doesn't mean anything. If you're talking about having a meeting that we can get together with and sit down and debate these issues, that's a different kind of thing. Mm -hmm. One last thing. In here, it mentions different places where it is a right of appeal to the city or to a court. Let me suggest, and I've mentioned this to others, that you as a city council do not want to be the court of last appeal. If, if it's my dog that's got a citation, I want to be treated just like if I got a citation for, for driving. You don't let those drivers come in here because they were speeding and, and appeal to you. The dog person shouldn't either. There should be a court specifically assigned for this that actually knows what it's talking about. And with all due respect, you guys, with the exception maybe of Carolyn, really don't. I wouldn't want to be in your shoes and have a, a bunch of people met it. I got a lot more I can talk about, but I'm going to step aside and let other people come up there and do it. Thanks, Randy. Thank you. Joe Kamire, 526 Home Park Boulevard, Waterloo. Uh, you know, I, I, I can't say anything but good about what you're doing. And I, I totally agree with what you're doing, and I totally agree that it's going after the dog, the, the dog owner. The only thing that got involved in me involved in this situation is I own a pit bull. Number two, I've, I've pulled two of them. My pit bull is one of the friendliest dogs you'd ever want to meet. But there's something about my dog, and I'm listening to this ordinance, and what you're trying to tell me as an owner is I'd have to 100% guarantee you that my pit bull is not mean. Well, I also have a Shih Tzu, and they also sleep in the same bed. They also drink out of the same bowl. But I'll guarantee you my Shih Tzu, under the term of mean, is meaner than my pit bull. Because if she don't like something, she's going to nip at your foot. <coughs> my concern is here is, I don't want my dog biting anybody. I don't want my dog abusing anybody in any way, shape, or form. But I can't guarantee that. It's a dog. I'm doing everything I can to make sure, and I've raised that dog so that it's a good dog, it's a friendly dog, it's, a, it's all kinds of stuff. But my dog can't read. We've got a whole bunch of derelicts sitting over in this building over here that can read, and they're still over there. I'm, I just want to make sure that you protect me in the same time. It's possible that my dog can get out. It's possible that my dog can bite somebody. I cannot guarantee that not happening. I just want to be treated fair when that happens. Because I'll, I'll guarantee you I'm going to cooperate with everything you say because I don't want that to happen. I don't. So <laughs> as you go through this thing, think about us that are good, responsible owners I guess I'm patting myself on the back there, but uh, so be it. Mm -hmm. I want my dogs to be good. I don't want you to have a problem with my dog, but I can't guarantee that. But just give me a fair shake if something does happen. And Bill, I, I think that that's the, as, as Sandy was presenting, there's a great deal of discretion involved with all of this. And you know, if you know Maria at all yes. and Sandy at all, you know that that's going to be uh, yeah. exercise, the, that discretionary part but, of it. So. But I'm just voicing what a lot of people are thinking out there. Sure. And I think that's the, the, the okay. concern about this ordinance is that, <coughs> look at, <laughs> I'm going to tell you, pr there's probably 80% of the dogs in Waterloo aren't even registered. They don't even get a dog tag. And, and, and Mr. Cole and, and you guys have brought up a good issue here. How did they, I didn't know about this dog ordinance, the, the depth of the dog ordinance, until all this come up. Seriously. And I've had a dog now for over 10 years, 15 years. I didn't, I didn't have a clue about this thing. You know why? Because I was never faced with it. I come down, bought my license, bought my dog park license, went about my business. Until all this come up, I wasn't aware of it. So I understand what you're saying, but there's a lot of people out there. Thanks, Bill. Never seen this document. Thank you. Thank you. Mike? Right. Could you give us your name and address? Mike Goings, 1203 West 2nd Street, Waterloo. Um, first, I'd like to say thanks for listening to the input and using some of that input. I've seen some of the things that I that I suggested been in the ordinance. Um, one of my big concerns, in, and Sandy kind of addressed it, was um, in the potential, potentially dangerous dog definition, there 
and uh, there's a definition of regulated dogs, and that includes the potentially dangerous dog. But as you read through the other the other uh, subsections, they're they're divided out between vicious dog, uh, dangerous dog, and and the potentially dangerous dog. Uh, where I have and I have concerns about that definition is um, my dog's a dominant dog. Um, he's not a bully. He's a dominant dog. It's a Labrador mix. Uh, we're out walking one day, and we walked by a, a dog that was chained to a tree, no problems. Uh, we got about 20 feet. He turned around to glance back at that dog, saw that the dog was moving towards us, and uh, took a defensive stand. By that posture, he's a potentially dangerous dog. Um, the other, you know, so I'd like to see that. That's where I have a lot of concerns is in, in that potentially dangerous dog area, um, because as you read through it, uh, it does it does get confusing. And the other thing is with Apollo, uh, my dog is being a dominant dog. If another dog like tries to put its neck over the back of Apollo's neck, which is a dominant position in the dog world, Apollo lets him know that's not okay. So in his in his eyes. Um, so, I, and I, I guess I, the question is, was the intent to loop the, in the regulated dogs to have the um, potentially dangerous dog in the same grouping of, of the uh, vicious and dangerous dog? Because then there's, you know, the bard from the city just because he's potentially dangerous. Um, the at-large definition um, includes that they can use a rope or a cord as a leash around the dog's neck. I don't see that as, as acceptable as a dog owner. Um, in the tethering law, in the new tethering proposal, it says that it has to be attached to a collar. I think that would be an acceptable, you know, if they're, if they're using anything around the dog's neck, it should be attached to a collar and, and have a swivel. Um, definition of a caretaker. Caretakers used uh, a lot throughout the ordinance. There's a part of that that says the caretaker uh, is defined as a person that has having possession of an animal for a period of more than six hours. Why that six hours? What, what if ha something happens before that six hours? Um, as, you're, as you're reading through, you can see, I, mean, I was surprised how much the word caretaker was used throughout the ordinance. Um, so that, uh, and the noisy, the noisy and annoying animals, I couldn't hear Sandy's response to why, David's question of why the three people. Um, I, I'm one that's fight that, that. Mike, the uh, reason for that, I'll let, it sounds like Chris is getting up, is, is we were having an incredible issue with uh, neighbors just being vindictive. Uh, there really wasn't an issue with a barking dog, but a neighbor was, was had, a, had, a, had a bone to pick with the next neighbor, so they were making complaints. And it was the court system that actually advised us in order to make the legitimates be complaint that it required more than one complainant. Okay. Um, nowadays, videotape widely widely used in fact one of the part for the dangerous dog if it's at if it's still in the city you can use videotape mm -hmm. as evidence um, I would ha I would like to have you look at that because mm -hmm. you know as a, as a former police officer you know sure. that you know to get people involved is pretty much impossible yeah, got two minutes okay me. I will that's I that's my main point about that because I've been dealing with the barking dogs now and you know neighbors don't want to get involved so yeah. you know and I, th I think uh, I, 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 I think that the uh, videotaping or audio whatever might be uh, an alternative, and, and we'll explore that, Mike. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I, I, it's, you, you've got, we've got a meeting that's supposed to start in one minute. We will have many more conversations about this before it's over with, and please feel free to submit written comments. Uh, call, call myself or call Sandy. It's better to call Sandy because if you call me, then I just try to relate it to Sandy. But uh, call us or, or write us and, and get us information. Uh, we'll let the dust settle on this and we'll get comments and feedback. And uh, we'll have another session that we will have more input from the public uh, regarding this. And maybe we'll tweak a couple of things that we've heard today. And I'm sorry the hour went uh, quickly uh, as I thought it would. Motion to adjourn. Second. Did you do that? I think we have a motion and a second uh, to adjourn. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, motion carries. We're adjourned. Thank you, and thank you all very much.
Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the regularly scheduled session of the Waterloo City Council uh, on this January 21st. Madam Clerk, could you read the roll, please? Yes, Ms. Cole. Here. Mr. Jones. Here. Mr. Schmidt. Here. Mr. Lind. Here. Mr. Morrissey. Here. Mr. Wilper. Here. Mr. Hurt. Here. Thank you very much. If you would all join me in standing for just a moment of silent reflection and prayer, please. Thank you very much. Our pledge tonight is going to be led by Mr. Paul Hutting, our Leisure Services Director. Paul, please. Please join me in our pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. You may be seated. Mr. Mayor. We're going to start tonight. Uh, do we do the proclamation first? Huh? No. Do the the agenda in the minutes. Yep. Okay. Do the agenda in the minutes. Sorry. I'd like to make a motion to approve an amended agenda, and that amendment is to add uh, Catholic School Week's uh, proclamation, and also to amend item one B twelve, change Mayor's appointment of the Complete Streets Advisory Committee by removing Sherman Wise and replacing that name with Will Frost. Also with the approval of the uh, minute agenda, I move that we approve the minutes of January 13, 2014's regular session. Second. Council, do you have questions or comments regarding the agenda or the minutes? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. And now we have a proclamation. Dale Monroe. Dale, if you would please come up. Just come through the door there and Again. We came up in the elevator, but welcome again. Thank you. Nice Thank you to see much. you. Just turn and face us here. We'll, uh, we'll recognize and read this proclamation for you for Waterloo Catholic Schools Week. Thank you. City of Waterloo, Iowa proclamation. Whereas education is critically important to the health and economic vitality of Waterloo and plays a significant role in a family's choice to where to live. And whereas every child in Waterloo has the right to the highest quality schools possible. And whereas citizens, citizens across Waterloo agree that improving the quality of education, particularly for the neediest of children, and expanding access to highly effective schools should be an issue of importance to our city leaders. And whereas the citizens, I'm having trouble with that, That's citizens right. of Waterloo recognize the critical role that an effective and accountable system of education plays in preparing all students to be success, successful adults in a global economy. And whereas Waterloo is home to a multitude of high quality public schools, <coughs> private schools, and Catholic schools. And educational variety not only helps to diversify our economy, but also enhances the vibrancy of our community. And whereas Waterloo has many high quality teaching professionals, in public, non-public, and Catholic schools who are committed to educating children, and whereas through continued teamwork between parents, teachers, and schools, our community can strive to provide greater educational diversity and instructional excellence for our children. And whereas the vital cause of education reform is one that transcends ideology and political party affiliation, and whereas Catholic Schools Week is a nationally celebrated event and during this week we join with millions of parents, educators, schools and organizations around the country to raise awareness of the importance of Catholic schools for our city, state and country that challenge and motivate all our students to succeed. Now therefore I, Buck Clark, Mayor of the City of Waterloo, Iowa, do hereby proclaim in Waterloo, Iowa the week of January 26th through February 1st, 2014, as Waterloo Catholic Schools Week. Dale, there is that. Let me get a microphone for you. Maybe you'll say a couple of words about the event. There you are, sir. 
Well, thank you very much, Mayor and City Council. Appreciate this. The uh, event is scheduled for lots of activities in the parishes as well as our schools. Uh, there's a calendar of events out on our website, and we invite all of you to participate. We appreciate the opportunity to help serve the children of uh, Waterloo. Very good. Thank and, you very and, much. And Dale, thank you for what you and your colleagues do for all of our kids. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Have a great evening. Mr. Hart. I make a motion to receive, place on file, and approve the consent agenda items uh, 1A through B23. Also, with the approval of the consent agenda, I move that we make our bills payment, which will be read by our finance chair. The bills this week are $804,118.48. Second. All in favor, please. I'm sorry, it's a roll call vote. Madam Clerk, please. Ms. Cole? Yes. Mr. Jones? Yes. Mr. Schmidt? I would vote yes on everything except I need to abstain on a payment of $123.50 to Schmidt Telecom Partners for work done on behalf of the city. Okay. Mr. Lind? Yes. Mr. Morrissey? Yes. Mr. Welper? Yes. Mr. Hurt? Yes. Very good. The motion carries. Item number two, please. Mr. Mayor? Mr. Schmidt? Item number two, I'd like to make a motion to receive and file, file proof of publication of notice of public hearing, and that is for the City Limits Urban Revitalization Area. Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That motion carries and the hearing is now open. Madam Clerk, did you have any written objections on file to this item? There were none. Is there anyone in the audience that would like to speak either for or against item number two, renewing the Clura in Waterloo? A second time. Mr. Mayor, I make a motion and to close the hearing and receive the recommendation of approval of the Planning, Programming, and Zoning Commission. Second. Council, uh, do you have comments or questions at this point? Sir. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? The motion carries. Mr. Mayor, I'd like to make a motion to receive, file, consider, and pass for the first time an ordinance amending ordinance number 5089 by extending the established city limits urban revitalization area through December 31st, 2017. Second. Madam Clerk, it's a roll call vote, please. Mr. Jones? Yes. Mr. Schmidt? Yes. Mr. Lind? Yes. Mr. Morrissey? Yes. Mr. Welper? Yes. Mr. Hart? Yes. Ms. Cole? Yes. We're good that motion carries. Mr. Mayor, I make a motion to suspend the rules. A second. Madam Clerk, please. Mr. Schmidt? Yes. Mr. Lind? Yes. Mr. Morrissey? Yes. Mr. Welper? Yes. Mr. Hart? Yes. Ms. Cole? Yes. Mr. Jones. Yes. Very good. The motion carries. Uh, Mr. Schmidt. Yes. Mr. Mayor, I'd like to make a motion and to consider and pass for the second and third times and adopt the ordinance. Second. second. Okay. Madam Clerk, please. Mr. Lind. Yes. Mr. Morrissey. Yes. Mr. Welper. Yes. Mr. Hart. Yes. Ms. Cole. Yes. Mr. Jones. Yes. Mr. Schmidt. Yes. Very good. The motion carries. Uh, thank you. That's, a, that's a, a good deal done. Item number three, please. Mayor. Mr. Hart. I move to receive and file and instruct city clerk to open and read bid inadvertently missed and refer to J.B. Bolger, Golf and Downtown Area Maintenance Manager for a review for the purchase of a new 2014 Timberwolf TW10 log splitter. Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? The motion carries. And just for explanation for those that might remember, we opened a bid last week on this particular item. Uh, we did, you know, there was a small envelope in the bottom of the bid envelope that we missed, so there were two bids instead of just one that we opened last week. We're going to open the second bid tonight. Madam Clerk, please. The bid was from Timberwolf of Rutland, Vermont. And the total bid is for $53,995.53,995.00. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Please. <clears throat> Similar, I Excuse thought. me, Mayor. Yes, sir. I'm sorry. I think it would be nice if Paul would give a brief explanation as to what that is. I had two different people ask me this week, why are we paying that much money for a log split? Okay. Very good. Thanks, Forrest. Paul Hudding, Leisure Services Director. Um, it's basically a very large log splitter that will handle 
tree trunks basically that are too big to do anything else with. So these tree trunks currently are being stockpiled at kind of at the waste management site and they're just collecting. So this will allow us to split those and then we can take those split pieces to the Falls Avenue site and they'll be available for general use for then they can be cut up by the public and used for firewood. Thanks, Paul. You're welcome. Very good. Uh, let's do four, five, and six, please, on the Mr. resolutions. Mayor, Ms. Cole. I move we adopt a resolution approving requests from Fire Chief to increase fees associated with friendship <laughs> fire protection in the amount of 5%, effective July 1st, 2014. I move we adopt a resolution adopting Waterloo Fire Rescue Ambulance Fee Schedule for fiscal year 2015. I move we adopt a resolution approving contract modification number two on the amount of $3,400 for work performed by KWS Inc. of Cedar Falls in conjunction with the fiber optic connection city network to Sportsplex building and authorize mayor to execute said document. Let's call this seven two, please, would you? I move we adopt a resolution approving completion of project and recommendation of acceptance of work performed by KWS Inc. of Cedar Falls at a total cost of $43,250 in conjunction with fiber optic connection city network to Sportsplex building. Second. Very good. Council, do you have questions or comments regarding four, five, six, or seven? Madam Clerk, it's a roll call vote, please. Mr. Morrissey? Yes. Mr. Welper? Yes. Mr. Hart? Yes. Ms. Cole? Yes. Mr. Jones? Yes. Mr. Schmidt? Yes. Mr. Lind? Yes. Very good. The motions carry. 8, 9, 10, please. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Schmidt? Item number 8, I'd like to adopt a resolution approving a contract with Advanced Systems, Inc. of Waterloo, Iowa for the purchase of an electronic document management system and to license additional software, including an assurance and support agreement <laughs> in the amount of $65,903, along with supporting hardware, not to exceed $92,000 for both software and hardware. Item number nine is adopting a resolution approving completion of project and recommendation of acceptance of work performed by Stickford Construction Company of Hudson, Iowa, and receive and file a two-year maintenance bond for the Sunnyside South Edition paving, sanitary sewer, and stormwater improvements, and receive and file a two-year maintenance bond. And item number 10 is adopting a resolution approving request of community planning and development staff to waive application of bidding policy and award the bid received from Veith Construction Corp of Cedar Falls, Iowa in the amount of $34,040 in conjunction with the fiscal year 2014 2672 and 2736 Logan Avenue Sanitary Sewer Services and authorize the mayor to execute said document. Second. Questions or comments, Council, regarding 8, 9, or 10? Madam Clerk, please. Mr. Welper? Yes. Mr. Hart? Yes. Ms. Cole? Yes. Mr. Jones? Yes. Mr. Schmidt? Yes. Mr. Lind? Yes. Mr. Morrissey? Yes. Very good. The motion is carried. Let's do 11 and 12, please. Mr. Mayor? Ms. Cole? I move we adopt a resolution approving request by GMJ2 Industries LLC. That would be Jim Ellis for the five lot final plat of Will Williston Field addition to allow for the construction of five new single family homes generally bounded by Williston Avenue, Pleasant Street, West 7th Street, and Allen Street. And 12 is a resolution approving a request by the same company, also known as Jim Ellis, for the four lot final plat of Baltimore Field Edition to allow for the construction of four new single family homes generally located north of Eureka Street and east of Vermont Street. Second. Very good. There's a motion and second. Council, do you have questions or concerns? Mr. Mayor. Mr. Lynn. No. Are those tax abated houses? Do they get tax abatements for a while? Noel Anderson, Community Planning Development Director. Um, they would be eligible for the cure or the clura, depending upon the location, just like any other house would be for those programs. Other than that, they're otherwise market rate houses. Mr. Welper? Mr. Mayor, I, uh, last week I think I requested that they possibly see some pictures of the houses that were going to be built and they, they weren't in our packet. Did Jim not have any pictures of those houses? I believe he does. In color. 
these. Uh, this I don't is care Jim, the color, but. Jim Ellis, uh, 402 East 4th Street, GMJ2 Industries. Um, I do have uh, pictures, uh, elevations, and floor plans that I can have uh, passed around there, showing each of the floor plans um, for the ranch style, split foyer, story and a half, and two story homes. So there are elevations and floor plans for each one. And then I also have a picture here of the signage that we're ready to put up on the sites for both the uh, Baltimore Field First Edition and the Williston Field uh, Edition for both those sites for the complete nine homes. Um, so Is those there a sign up there already, Jim. Uh, there is a sign on the northern section of Baltimore Field, not on the southern section. Okay. But these are for the southern section, um, and then there is no sign currently up there right now for Williston Field. Mr. Wilper? No, that's fine. Not right I, now? I, I, okay. Are there any further questions regarding 11 or 12? Madam Clerk, it's a roll call vote, please. Mr. Hart? Yes. Ms. Cole? Yes. Mr. Jones? Yes. Mr. Schmidt? Yes. Mr. Lind? Yes. Mr. Morrissey? Yes. Mr. Wilper? Yes. Very good. The motion carries. Item 13, please. Mr. Mayor? Mr. Hart? Move to adopt a resolution setting date of hearing as February 3rd, 2014, to approve a request by the <coughs> City of Waterloo to rezone 12 acres of land from RF, R, R4 to RP Plan Residence District and 110 acres of land from A1 Agricultural District to BP Business Park District, located at the southeast corner of Highway 20 and Ainsboro Avenue, and instruct the City Clerk to publish notice. Second. Council, do you have questions or comments? Madam Clerk, please. Ms. Cole? Yes. Mr. Jones? Yes. Mr. Schmidt? Yes. Mr. Lind? Yes. Mr. Morrison? Mr. Welper? Yes. Mr. Hart? Yes. Very good. The motion carries. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the end of our regularly scheduled business tonight. Conversely from last week when we had a two and a half hour meeting, tonight's a relatively short meeting. So, Mr. Mr. Mayor? Uh, Mr. Would it be inappropriate for me? What's your name? <laughs> Mr. Morrison? Patrick. Yes, sir. Patrick J. <laughs> Um, I had talked to Noel Anderson earlier, and uh, being that Clara has passed, I had uh, asked him or suggested maybe uh, for the sake of some of us out here who don't know that much about Clara versus Cura, if he could give just a brief synopsis for the public about what Clara and Cura is and the advantages uh, that, and, that it has for the taxpayers of Waterloo. Sure. No? Please. Noel Anderson, Community Planning and Development Director. Um, going back a number of years, over 10 years ago, the City of Waterloo actually had a uh, uh, group of UNI students do a uh, dilapidated housing uh, study, just a drive-by windshield survey of the City of Waterloo. Um, looking at that, the details of that, where they thought that there were some deteriorating housing or, or some needs for some infill development, the City of Waterloo adopted the Cura District, which is a consolidated urban revitalization area. Prior to that, there was about uh, seven separate smaller urban revitalization areas in small neighborhoods. Um, so this consolidated all of them together, uh, similar to what Des Moines did um, in the early 90s. The Cura actually uh, so located uh, basically north of Williston, covering large portions of uh, Ward 3 and Ward 4, um, up to about the Logan Plaza area, Donald Street area. Um, the Cura gives three years at 100% tax abatement or a 10-year graduated scale on tax abatement at 80%, 70%, 60%, 50, 40, 40, 30, 30, 20, 20 for the 10-year. That is eligible for any added taxable value um, of at least 10% on residential, 15% on commercial, um, but it's eligible for any residential, so that would be a new construction, um, improvements to an existing house or rehabilitation, additions to houses, um, any new commercial ventures, again, new constructions, additions, rehabilitations, or industrial, all within the Cura District. And again, that's a, a specific boundary located on, on incentive maps that we have in the City of Waterloo. Uh, about three years ago today, or three, year ago, three years ago, July 18th, uh, 2011, uh, the City of Waterloo was looking at um, ways to try and bring more one and two family homes, especially to the Waterloo area. Um, the City Council adopted the Clura, which is the City Limits Urban Revitalization Area. So essentially we took everything outside of the Cura 
out to the city limits and made that eligible for uh, three years at 100% tax abatement on just one and two family homes. Um, so anyone building new construction of a single family or a twin home would be eligible for the three years at 100% tax abatement. They'll still pay taxes on the land and all of these um, through the tax abatement, but the building value and all that uh, will be eligible for the abatement. And we have some, we have some uh, forms that they need to fill out with either program and the planning office. Um, we also have some <coughs> uh, pictures of homes that have been built under the Clura um, and the Cura, and they kind of give you approximate uh, information on what you'll save in tax savings. Thank you. Very good. Good question, Pat. Uh, it, it's also time for oral presentations. If there's anyone in the audience would like to speak to the mayor or council on any my, items of business, uh, please step to the microphone, give us your name and address, and as always, please limit your comments to three minutes. Mr. Mayor. Okay. Yes, sir. You just about waited too long. Before. I know. I'm pretty slow. Forest Dillard, 1725 Huntington Road. Uh, in mentioning the Cluras and Curas, at the building inspection department, people who come there who don't know about these things don't know enough to ask or get a form. I had some people buy a house across the street from me, do extensive remodeling and redevelopment, new windows, new siding, new roof, <coughs> were prepared to put in a new garage, new concrete, and they had never been told. I went over and, and uh, plowed the driveway one day and I told the lady, have you applied? And she said, for what? Mm -hmm. So I think maybe we need to do a better job of advertising that we do have it and it is for remodels as well as new homes. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's a good point and we should do that. Yeah. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Hart. Motion to receive and file oral comments and also we possibly add um, his comments, um, Councilman Morrissey's to the, the sure. oral comments as well. Sure. And to also adjourn to the executive session. Second. Okay, before we uh, do Mr. Walsh, I, I want to make one statement to, to Council. We are having our first department uh, budget review tomorrow morning with Kent Shankle and, and Cultural and Arts. The budget books are almost done. Uh, Cultural and Arts section is done. So if any of you want to pick those up from Michelle tonight prior to tomorrow morning's meeting, you may do so tonight after the meeting. Pick that up. Uh, but you will have to turn it in tomorrow morning after the meeting because it's not completely finished yet. So just a point of information. Mr. Walsh, are we adjourning properly? Uh, for the new council members are, who are here, I'll say why I do this. It's not okay. just to bore everybody. Okay. But by city attorney expressing an opinion as to whether or not it's a proper reason for a closed session, it protects the individual members who act in good faith on that reliance as long as it's made a record in the minutes contemporaneously with that. So that's why I do this. Uh, today's um, uh, executive session is for the purpose of discussing litigation, and that's a permissible reason for a closed session under 21.51C of the Code of Iowa. You need a roll call vote. Madam Clerk, please. Mr. Jones. Yes. Mr. Schmidt. Yes. Mr. Lind. Yes. Mr. Morrissey. Yes. Mr. Welper. Yes. Mr. Hart. Yes. Ms. Cole. Yes. Very good. We are adjourned. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.